This is part one of two of the Disaster Emergency Response and Recovery podcast. Both podcasts can be found on the HDIAC website. Hello, everyone. I'm Amber Garvey, a technical analyst at the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, or HDIAC. Today, I'll be interviewing Tanya Thornton on the Disaster Emergency Response and Recovery. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me, Amber, others at the HDIAC. I am honored to be here. I'm Dr. Tanya Thornton. I am an assistant professor at George Mason University's Char School of Policy and Government, where I also serve as the director for extramural projects, which is just a a fancy title without the pay for an acting assistant dean of research. So uh, I also coordinate uh, our emergency management and homeland security graduate certificate within our master's of public administration program. And when I'm not busy doing those things, I wear another hat. I also am the director for the Paul L. Posner Centers on the Public Service. All right. Thank you, Tanya. So um, my first question for you today is, what are some examples of terminology that are used to describe and classify disasters today? That's a great question, Amber. You know, when looking at this historically in terms of how our lexicon and the American English has evolved since, say, 1800, we didn't really have a good, thorough understanding of what we mean as disaster today. In fact, we didn't even use that term that often. We actually used the word hazard, but we all know hazard is a source of an, of an event, and disaster or a crisis or an emergency is an event. So when we start talking about emergency and crisis, those can be used in a number of other areas, whether it's a traffic accident emergency, um, a public health emergency, and then when we talk about crises, which could be a disaster, uh, it could be riot violence, it could be uh, oil crises, political crises, military crises. So there's all these different constructs around these certain terms that part of our population has used over the course of time, but not really understanding the historical context of what it meant at the time. So there's these fancy little tools out there called Google Ingram, where it is the Harvard Cultural Laboratory that partnered with the Google Books Project when they digitized a bunch of literary text. And they're still working on it. And so if you pop in a couple of these terms, you'll see very quickly the trajectory or where our lexicon started shifting. So when did disaster become part of our culture in terms of language? And it wasn't until about the 1920s, which is very interesting because if you know anything about the history of disasters, 1920s, wow, we were coming off the, the foothills of World War I. We had the Dust Bowl, we had the Great Mississippi River Flood, and let's not forget about the Great Recession. So, boom, and then disaster became a part of our everyday lexicon. When we talk about calamity or catastrophe, we reserve those for the most severe of disasters because, we, as we know today, I mean, they're just occurring all the time all around us. All right. So, how do disasters affect homeland defense and homeland security? Well, given the fact that emergency management is not a relatively old field, it got started in about the mid-1980s. In fact, we took a lot of our understanding and practices out of Australia and combating wildfires, but most of our practices have always been rooted in civil defense. And that's why you saw a struggle with some of our disasters in the 1980s, the 1990s, until FEMA was made a cabinet-level position. Obviously, when 9-11 happened, there was this reorientation towards terrorism and civil defense, and rightfully so. But then the natural and the what we would call other man-made disasters got bolted underneath the creation of DHS. And so um, when we talk about the response and recovery to disasters, a lot of times they do transcend borders, not just localities or states or regions in the United States, but oftentimes if there's a significant hurricane or if there's a significant attack. Uh, say, you know, the United States has several different borders, but also in the interest of our national security with USAID and other response efforts around the world to some of their, you know, their significant disasters. Do a certain number of people have to be affected to constitute a disaster? Not exactly. I mean, it's all in the individual perspective, disasters are socially constructed. They don't occur unless it intersects with human vulnerability. So a tornado is just a natural phenomenon that tears up some land, but until it actually hits the community and starts destroying critical infrastructure, again, something relevant for uh, defense and security, depending on what that critical infrastructure is. 
it's just a natural phenomenon, you know, something that we have no control over. Um, when we think of, you know, uh, man-made ha- uh, disasters or hazards, you know, some people would consider an active shooter that kills two or three people a disaster. So really it's the context of place and place has meaning because we have these shared histories, these shared cultures. And so that's why there's so much difficulty in terms of integrated response and recovery, let alone, you know, the, the mitigation and preparedness efforts. It's just everywhere someone's thinking a little bit differently about it. But no, there does not have to be a, a certain number for disaster to occur. Okay, thank you. Um, so why are some places more prone to disasters, and what is the most common natural disasters taking place in the U.S. today? Oh, goodness. Well, most people are hazard zone attracted regardless of who they are, where they live, what country and culture that they come from. Um, one key piece of this is we love to be around the water. Look at the world's population con- congregates mostly around coastlines. And that's where you also have a high number of earthquakes, a high number of uh, typhoons or hurricanes, also subjected to tsunamis, depending on, you know, if there was an earthquake. And then also power outages. We don't think about, you know, critical infrastructure system going down because of overload on the system as a disaster. But I guarantee you in 2003, when there was the great, you know, the Northeast blackout in that August in the middle of summer, I believe they would think it's a disaster. And then think about uh, when was it? 2016, uh, September, um, Puerto Rico, you know, lost uh, uh, power to 60% of its island. And this was prior to the hurricanes that wreaked havoc later. But still, um, there's not one most common natural disaster. It really is place dependent. But we are attracted to some of these key areas that we see are more prone to some natural phenomenon. And, you know, everyone loves the water. Exactly. I love the water, too. Um, So that kind of leads into my next question. Um, How does the location impact hazard vulnerability? That is uh, very important because we have a lack of an imagination. In fact, in the 9-11 Commission report, uh, uh, individuals were charged with having this lack of an imagination. And so my first class at, at George Mason, I had it was a, you know, a master's level course, and uh, we were talking about, well, what natural phenomenon or hazards are here in the DMV, you know, the district, metro, D.C., and, and Maryland area? And it, we, they were talking about an earthquake, which is minimal, terrorist attacks, uh, deluges, uh, flooding, other things. Now, like, what about tornadoes? You know, the climate is shifting, whether, regardless of if you believe in climate change or global warming, dare I say, or not. The climate is changing, and there's geophysical forces at play that we have no control over. Of course, they occur over millennia, and we're exer- we're exacerbating it with, uh, you know, just humans tend to do that. Um, and, and they said, oh, a tornado never occurs here. Well, the next week, lo and behold, there was a tornado that touched down in Maryland. I think this was 2014, and it killed a few people. And I thought, don't have a lack of imagination. Don't put yourself in the spot to think that, this type of disaster cannot occur here. Uh, case in point, I always ask, you know, people, when is the modern day active shooter scenario in a K-12, what was the first occurrence? And everyone, hands down, always says, Columbine High School. I'm like, wrong. Because although I did not, I was not at the high school at the time of its occurrence, I had switched high schools because trust me, it was a rough high school. Um, it was Pearl High School, Mississippi, November 1997, a year and a half prior to Columbine, right, because that was April 99. But it didn't get much attention because, A, it's Mississippi, and, B, it's Mississippi. So, but he was my he was my algebra partner, and I did ride the bus with him my freshman and sophomore years. I just switched high schools right as that had occurred. And so, well, I wouldn't have thought that that would have occurred where you, you know, you went to school. I went, well, have you ever thought to, you know, Ask me why I'm interested in the things I'm interested in. So not having this lack of an imagination of where things occur really will open up our thinking to say, hey, you know, it's possible anywhere. Tornadoes are possible in other parts of the world now. Uh, Hurricanes are uh, occurring more along the northern Atlantic Ocean, not just in the Gulf. Oil spills. And so just not having a lack of an imagination of where these things occur, I think, will allow us to move forward in a better planning environment and then, by extension, response and recovery. Okay. Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. um, so my next question is, I guess, do different communities have like preset emergency response and re recovery equipment on hand? Um, and are they like tailored to that specific area or their particular needs? Well, there are some equipment requirements. Obviously, there's areas that are prone to blizzards or super storms, you know, snowstorms. But if you get a blanket of ice or snow in, in the, say, the deep south or southern states in the United States, they don't have the equipment. A, they don't have the budget at the local or state level to actually utilize that equipment, say, maybe once, twice a year. Um, and it, they can't justify it because that takes away from other areas, such as education, which is a critical need, and then also public health, which is also a critical need. And so it's just uh, – it becomes a matrix of, of prioritizing your societal needs at the local community level. Um, others, you know, no one wants to plan for an active shooter situation, but now we have these uh, uh, Department of Education grants that help different school systems get up to speed with what they would do, how they would lock down, how they would, you know, if they need a school resource officer. Um, others, tornadoes, you, you can't really, unless you have tornado sirens in the community, uh, you know, some can afford them, some do not. Some are just now understanding that they may need to uh, find investments in order to, you know, uh, provide a, a, as much warning as possible. Because when we talk about disasters, that's the one that gives us the least amount of time in the natural disaster or hazard world. Um, oil spills, you know, you can't predict those. You hope that you can control them, but you can't. Uh, and in another in environmental crisis. No one wants to see these things happen, but, you know, no one wants to actually invest up front because they don't see the return on the investment until it's after the fact, right? That's why you have these mutual aids and, and other regional contacts so you can rely on uh, um, equipment and other resources from them. Okay. And um, how does the classification of a disaster impact the assessment risk? Ooh, okay. So when we talk about natural disasters or natural hazards, rather, they are obviously rooted in the natural environment. They are considered acts of God. They are perceived with a per, they are perceived with a a, a a lack of control because if God is in control, you're not control, and they're thought to be unpreventable. That is a very different thinking than man-made hazards, which are sometimes the result of negligence or malicious behavior or, or intent, uh, um, system failure, or just pure accidental. You know, sometimes ignorance is to blame. They are perceived with a, an associated uh, loss of control, because if you are the person who created the system, you are in control. There's often identifiable parties to be held accountable. And then, um, you know, when you look at that as com in comparison to, to natural, say, in the case of uh, Louisiana, you had Hurricane Katrina. That was very catastrophic. It was seen as an act of God, right? Because now, the system, the levy failures was a different type of response, and so Army Corps of Engineers got blamed a little bit because the year prior, they had done this exercise called Hurricane Pan, in which they simulated what would happen if a hurricane as strong as Katrina came, and they knew that the levees would fail, but they did nothing with the information. They didn't circulate the information. It only surfaced really after Hurricane Katrina, and then, you know, when we get into the you know, after action reports, the lessons learned, what not to do in the future, um, compared to Deepwater Horizon oil spill, which occurred in the same geographic area, hit the same communities. And, you know, there is someone to blame, BP, Transocean, uh, others. And so they went in with a more swift response, you know. So um, it's just looking at it from high level, the response when you plan, and you respond and you recover from, knowing the ethnological difference between those two will help help speed those processes up. This has been part one of the Disaster Emergency Response and Recovery podcast. The conversation with Dr. Tanya Thornton continues where I left off in part two, which can be found on the HDIAC website.